So, today's a special. This is going to be standalone, not a part of season two, and not a part of season three, which is in the works. So and if we say this out loud, yeah, then we're going to be actually held to it. We have to do it. So. so, it'll be once a month, and it'll be a video or audio podcast. You can access it however you it'll want. It'll be both and. Both and. Yeah. We're not going to trick you. Like one week it's video. No, one week but like it's audio. you want to get it on your regular podcasting platform. You right. don't have to watch it on YouTube. You right. know that kind of thing. But if you like watching. Right, then you have that as an option. So, right. and it'll be a once a month podcast with 12 episodes. What are we doing today? So today, um, we are we want to talk about the role of a pa- of the pastor and uh, predominantly, we think this is an important subject for us to talk about as we come out of the pandemic yes and particularly here in Canada we know we have a lot of listeners all over the world yeah um, but I guess all over the world churches are opening back up and I think there is this idea of um, I think people are are asking themselves questions um, about Ecclesia like about our gathering yeah but then that leads to questions of the pastor and I think um, if you've been reading any Christian research um, lately you will have read that it's not the, super hopeful right now right that the the barnett institute uh conducted a survey of pastors across north america and what that survey found is that more than 30 percent i think it was actually 29 percent of pastors were seriously considering quitting yeah so the long tail some pastors have been holding on holding on holding on feeling like they can't bail in the middle of all of this difficulty some have quit there's already been a sort of attrition that's happening and some are right on the cusp and if things were difficult in their role before they got exacerbated during the pandemic and now uh, this is a, an increased reality that maybe is going to have some negative impact. Right and I think that this is a real issue that we have to speak to because we know that there's a coming deficit of pastoral leadership yep. um, as baby baby maybe baby boomers retire oh. i can talk yeah i forgot how baby to talk. boomers yeah as right. they retire then we're going to have a deficit already but if 30 percent of new pastors are also saying get yeah. me out of this role or people who've been in the game for a while are just tapped out and done going to reimagine their vocation going forward and the truth is like you're either a pastor if you're into this theological podcast you're either a pastor or you're probably in a church community, or we would hope. So we all have something to do with the role of the pastor, even if you yourself are not a pastor. So we polled some of our friends ahead of doing this episode to ask them, like, what would you want our listeners to know about the challenge of describing your role as a pastor? And it was super interesting because, I don't know, within a half an hour, three pastors wrote me back who don't know each other and said, I have no emotional margin to answer this question. It makes my blood boil or I am too fatigued Mm. to even try one more time to describe what it is that I do. I, I just literally can't weigh in. And then I had one friend who took a few days and he wrote back and then he said, I feel like one of the greatest difficulties for him personally, which isn't necessarily one that I face, but I think it's totally valid. He feels like he's expected to bring vision to the church like he's Moses coming off the mountain, and at the same time, distill the collective vision from within the life of the church. So it's like, which is it? Do you want me to like just tell and and call and gather and be this catalytic person, or, or do you want me to like pull all the threads and synthesize it into some future arc. Right. And pastors are feeling that pressure even more post pandemic. We're not quite post, but knowing like we are long range thinkers. Typically we have to have strategy and with reopening and everybody coming in into a new season, there's hope for that to be really good, but there's a certain pressure on pastors yeah, right now. And I, and I think for all of us, this is really important, whether we are pastors mm-hmm. or whether we're uh, people that are in the church, because I think as leaders, our hope is that more people would become theologically engaged. I think this is the point of this yeah. podcast. <laughs> but yeah. if we don't have strong pastoral leadership, that, that has implications for the long-term trajectory of people's theological health. engagement yeah. and health in community. 
And um, so, so we wanted to talk about what, what does it mean and what should our expectations be right. of a pastor from a biblical and a theological point sure, of view? Sure, because there's going to be different models. And depending on the context you're in, like I work bivocationally, not, not every pastor I know does. So, you know, there's going to be those kinds of nuances that would impact. But, you know, if you think, like, if you ask the average person, I mean, how many times have people said something like, what do you do all week? Like, mm. it doesn't take you very long to write your talk mm. for Sunday. Uh, I had someone recently ask me, like, do you get up early on Sunday morning and write that talk? Right. Or do you just do that off the cuff? Oh, off your, like, from people, your heart. From people your heart. think we do that with the podcast. Podcast. See this, people? These are notes. Notes. Pages. There's research and thought in writing and crafting. And um, then... Otherwise, because then it would be awful if she and I tried to talk together. <laughs> Because Jess would go on a hundred rabbit trails and tell a million jokes. And Joyce would talk at least 10,000 words in 30 minutes. Right. This is a true fact. So, <laughs> but when you think about the role of the pastor, like just sort of throwing mud at the wall, like what the average person thinks, I, I, I mean, they think that we, we do a sermon, some of us and some of and us we, don't. And we pray. Yeah. Maybe we pray. Maybe like people have some crisis. Like some people are aware of that. Yeah. They often think of like um, a, sort of a small town, old school, mm -hmm. older person kind of filter, maybe from like the 1950s or maybe Gilead. they- Gilead. Right. The book. Marilyn it, Robinson wrote a great book. It is book, a good book. Gilead. It is a really good book. And I read it and I thought, oh, if only I could pastor in that kind of context. No, I did not think that. No, you didn't. Because no, you wanted I, to be no, urban. No, I thought about that. And thought, but it's God. not, I mean, that is an on the ground, in community kind of narrative about a pastor's life. But it, yeah, most of us don't have those contexts. We're in... Um, suburbia or urban settings or you know we're m maybe um, multi-staffed situations or whatever it, it looks a little different than the leave it to beaver kind of communities right and so this is really important that we actually address it, our idealism for what our pastor should be or what we think a pastor should be this is true of any truth we come to though we actually have to address yep. our idealism with it first yep and then that allows us to like step back and go okay is this idealism or is this really theologically sound ideas and even in that pushing back and that shift that wrestle you know there's been some good things in recent years where people are like challenged how we do church and the parachuting in kind of thing and mega church going through a bit of scrutiny and then there's you know things like the parish collective right um, which I think has some really good arc in it like be rooted where you are right. and think of the the neighborhoods as all the people that you would minister to not just the people in the doors of your church but there's still some kind of idealism i think embedded in it in trying to offload some of the pressure of maybe a, a mega church model and having to to try to grow to that kind of metric right i don't know if people are aware the average size of a canadian church at least for our canadian listeners like pay attention but here also this is for our american listeners is it the same well? yeah. same statistic under 100 people yeah so i think the actual metric is in canada 83, is 83 83 people so yeah. if you belong to a church more than 83 people you're not the um, average you're bigger than average yeah so but the expectation sometimes even if you've got a church of you know 70 or you've got a church community of 170 or maybe you're in a church of 400 or bigger there is a certain pressure on pastors um, that they'll be like that pastor that they watched online that has a church of 8,000 or mm -hmm. that the communication coming out of the church for like social media or something would be like the church that has 8,000 and has uh, eight people full time in their marketing department. Correct. Right? Like you got to think through the filter of like, what are we actually asking for from the local small church? Or the local average church. Right. And, you know, I think the hope is, I think every pastor, their, their hope is that people would come to the Lord and that their churches would grow. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't live without that expectation, but we also have to live in the now, recognizing that if you're bigger than 83, pretty good. Yeah, you're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So I think what we have to address 
probably off the top is what a pastor is not. Yeah. Because I think before we get to what a pastor is, we, we have to get we have to, to deal with some of the myths. Right. So I think the first thing is that uh, many people will come to a pastor and uh, relate to them as a parent. Yep. So they want a father figure, or in our case, uh, a, a mother, mother figure. figure. Advice, um, sort of uh, encouragement. Um, maybe they had a youth pastor or a young adults pastor that was kind of a mentoring role. And then they grew up, but they're still looking for that kind of, I mean, but it, it, it's still in a, in a little bit of a parenting kind of the posture. The I crash at your house and eat all your food. And I and, go home really late. And I use your washer and dryer. <laughs> and that's the relationship that a lot of people have expectation yeah. for. But I mean, the reality is that that's not, I, I think about our own lives and think that's, that's not doable. We both have multiple children. And multiple jobs. Right. <laughs> so put those things together. It just doesn't, it's not viable. A lot of people also have an expectation that your pastor is going to be your counselor. Like so a free you, therapist. Yeah. Like if you need a counseling, but you didn't want to lay out any box and your benefits aren't going to cover. Or you didn't want to go during the day. You didn't want to oh, take an gosh, hour off right. and go during the day. You could meet them at night right. and they could sort out all your problems. Right. Because the pastor is, in that view, not a professional. So they can fit you in to their family time. Because <laughs> you're or a friend. Right, because you're, yeah, so we're getting into So that, sorry, we, we <laughs> didn't overlap there, but can, can we just talk about the therapist for a second? Yeah. So most pastors um, are, are people people. Yeah. But I think we and need we to. And we care. Yeah, but the, some of us do. Yes, we care. We care. But we're about not people. trained. No, we're not trained. And it's above. To do clinical It's counseling. above our, it's pay above our pay grade. And yeah. all of my friends who are therapists say amen to right. that. So I would just say this, if you're a pastor and you're listening to this and you've been trying to fill the role of counselor, like one of the best advices I often give um, other pastors is if you move to a new community or you've been there for a while and you haven't done this, find out who the most reputable counselors are for marriage counseling, for anxiety, depression, for grief counseling. Um, you know, those yeah. kinds of, what are the things that people are going to come to you with? Find out who your go-to people are and have a list and refer people and even use some of the benevolent funding in your church if possible to assist people who do not have benefits so that they don't come with false expectations to the pastor mm -hmm. to be able to provide what the pastor cannot provide. Because it's not weakness to say, I'm that really I didn't sorry, get trained I, to don't, do that. I don't have the no. capabilities of We might have taken pastoral that. care classes, but that is a different kind of equipping yeah, I, I kind of think of it like saying you took home ec classes, <laughs> so therefore you're a chef. <laughs> or that yeah, or that no. you can now be a food blogger. Like, or, or I watched a YouTube video about how to cut people's hair, and if I cut <laughs> your hair, which I cut many people's hair, but I am no hairdresser. Right. God only knows that you do not want me to cut your hair because I, I only have I only have one haircut. <laughs> And you, do the, you do that one. haircut for your boys, which you do a good job. But you no, also I don't, did I don't that. cut their hair anymore. They you said no. You also did no that way. haircut for Julie I did in for university. I'm so sorry, Julie. <laughs> I do love you. We've seen I pictures. I gave you a terrible haircut. Okay, so, okay, so but that, that's right, similar. That's a good way and, to describe it. And when you're it. assuming that your pastor can be your free therapist, I mean, just get ready for a homemade haircut. Because <laughs> right. that's the kind of it's therapy you're going to get. It's not going to work out real well for you. Like, and if you're a pastor and you have a propensity towards therapy... Great. Go get your master's in say, counseling. Say you have your master's in counseling and you work as a pastor, then you have the ability to say that is something I can provide. We are not those people. And the average pastor is also not those people. The idea, can we just talk about pastor as a paid friend? Mm. A pastor is not your paid friend. Well, they don't know. It, and I would, I would go so far as to say, unless the pastor says to you, I am so happy you are my friend. It's not, it's not a rejection of you that they um, can't be your friend. This is a little hard to talk it's about. It's hard to talk about. Because we have the difficulty of our own people in our own church listening. And we love you, okay? So this is not any way of us saying we don't love the people in our communities. But there's a type of oh, friendliness, yes. And are we Christian community? Do we love one another? Yes. But the idea that the church in general, that everybody would become your BFF, that's not realistic. Uh, and the idea that the pastor, mm -hmm. whether it's a department 
person, if you're in a bigger church and like you are serving in that department, or if it's a smaller context and you have like one or two people in key leadership in your church, that you're going to get to be really close with them. Or even just you have some things, you don't have enough friendship, you are feeling a bit lonely, and you just like to make time to connect with the pastor, and you go out for coffee. Like, we've been in these situations where mm, you maybe go and meet someone, or you go for a walk, and you're trying to figure out what is this about? What are we here for? And then they'll say, oh, I just wanted to hang out with you. Mm -hmm. Just saying, no, this is my work life. This is the hours that I'm giving. Then we try to figure out, okay, let's see if there's some pastoral care we can give to this situation or some discipleship. But that's that's them coming with the wrong expectation. Right. And I would say that it's really similar to going to your doctor and expecting that you'll be friends with your doctor. I Nobody mean, your doctor that. is friendly. My doctor, I believe, believes I'm very funny. Right. If you're listening, Dr. Dollywell, <laughs> I hope this is true. <laughs> but in no way would I say to my doctor, hey, do you hang out? Do you want to watch a movie tonight? Right. I mean, if my doctor said to me, hey, would you like to hang out? But don't you think this speaks a little bit to the, um, the tension of pastor as professional? Right. And, and part of it is, I think, because our lives, uh, the way that we teach often is to um, show a part of ourselves. Yeah, and it's relational. Yeah, and it's relational. And I think we have to curate what part of ourselves we show that doesn't mean that we're being hypocritical and not showing all right. of ourselves, but we do have a we do have relational equity with yeah. people. Like when I teach homiletics, that's preaching, uh, I'm always telling um, students there is a certain amount of vulnerability you must bring as a preacher, but you mustn't be inordinately vulnerable. This isn't about you. And so we're trying to create a healthy interplay as somebody who's teaching in the life of the church. Um, so that they can see how do we get our life on the ground with Jesus. But we don't swing that so hard into uh, it's all about us. So I think that that does play into our expectations of relational connection, personal connection to the pastor. I and, mean, and this in no way means that the pastor or that your pastor doesn't value you. Right. Doesn't It really speaks more to the issue of... Your pastor is not doesn't have an infinite amount of time, though. Right. And particularly if you're part of a church that's larger than 50 people. Yeah. Um, and if your pastor has a family, uh, you you only have to do the math to say... How many hours are there in, yeah. in a week that can be allocated? So we're going to come to some of what we do do, and that might help bring some clarity as opposed to what we're not. But I think this is an important piece, and the idea, I mean, we had, we've had people, you know, leave. Obviously, all pastors welcome new people and say goodbye to people. This is part of you our, always say it, so our weekly you rhythms. You say it like it's like a weekly rhythm. Because but it kind so, of is, it's so and it's sad. hard. It's hard for pastors every time somebody says, it peace out. Worst. But, you know, I always try to do what I call sort of an exiting interview. And I'm always asking people for good feedback because if they're leaving and they're not, say, moving across the country, those are the best kinds of leavings. Mm -hmm. But if they're leaving and they're like, I just don't really feel like I fit here or I found somewhere else I'd rather be, whatever, the body of Christ is big. We can celebrate that and bless you and, you know... Uh, we don't have a corner on Hopefully the Hopefully you won't listen to this podcast right. and tell us that's why you're leaving. Right. But the, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but the challenge sometimes, and this has happened to me, you know, multiple times. It's not one time. Where somebody said, I just was really hoping, um, because your community is smaller. So, you know, when we were under 200, um, I used to hear this more. I was hoping I'd found sort of a small community church and I really liked you and Callum and I thought we could be friends. And now I'm leaving because you never have time for me. And I think, oh my goodness. So we both work part time. I work, well, Callum works more full time now, but I work under 20 hours a week for my church and I have other jobs and I have kids like just mentioned and 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 so what am I supposed to actually realistically fit into that window and even if I worked full-time mm -hmm. for this church you might meet with the pastor twice a year if you made an appointment mm -hmm. so that I could see everyone in the life of the church do you know what I mean mm -hmm. and then so I just feel like we have to address this idea as 
pastor as friend and the idea that we could be exceptional. Everyone else won't get that, but I will. Right. Because I think that is kind of in the yeah, fiber and I, of I mean, I think people. I don't think this is just, I think this is, it's human to think to you're be exceptional. Ju- or like, to I be drawn, we, we or think, just, yeah, just to be drawn to a leader and want to spend more time with them. I don't think there's things that are wrong with that. No. It's just managing the expectations and what's realistic and looking at it kind of what I call a reverse knowing. So not just your need and desire, but like what's a realistic expectation of that person. Right. And I think, you know, I think historically um, pastors didn't address this kind of thing, but it's also why historically pastors' families suffered. really suffered. And there's I think, a, yeah, I a, think a, our age and perhaps younger than us, just said, no, we're not going to do that to our kids. My children are going to know me. They're going to know my name. Yeah. Um, I had a really hard time with this at the beginning when, when I first started pastoring because in some way I carried a lot of false guilt. So I would say to people, well, I have an appointment at 7 and I have one at 8, but sure, I can meet you at 11. Till finally, my husband said to me, nope. Jess, if, if you're going to keep doing this, you, you can't have this job. It's not sustainable. I and, had... A wiser guy, are you going to say something? No, I was going to tell a joke about Dave, but (laughs) it's a good thing that I have you, Dave. (laughs) I had an older pastor that asked me, because he could see that I was maybe working too much, he he asked me to keep a three-month sort of schedule and Mm -hmm. show it to him. And he basically distilled it down to, I was trying to fit 12 hours of work into five hours a day, because I had at least three hours of emergency and interruption every day. And... um, So he was like, you have an unmanageable work plan. And that was before I had a husband and kids. Mm -hmm. I was 18 years in my vocation as a pastor before I had children. So I kind of had an opposite reality, but I thought I was limitless. And he said to me, if you keep, he said, your life's like a drink offering. If you keep pouring out at this pace, you're done at 38. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I don't know, maybe I was 29 or 30 at the time. That's very old. 38. I wanted to be able to go for the long haul, right? Mm -hmm. So how am I going to get there if I am perpetually living at a pace that's untenable. And I think, I mean, I know we talked about Sabbath and a Sabbath-oriented way of life in season one. Right. Um, But that played into certainly my own self-expectations. Right. And I think for pastors, I think, um, and this is something we talk to our our friends and colleagues about, is that you have this, um, if you love people, you do on some level deal with like weird false guilt. Like I really should get out with this person and I really should be friends with these people. I can remember having this and um, I think it was you who was my toughest critic when we moved here saying yeah. like, how are you going out with 20 people a week? How right. is that ever sustainable? Right. And remember you said to me, you're only allowed to go out with five. Well, and the part that I was trying to make the point to you was you're also setting those people up with false expectations that this is going to be their ongoing reality. Mm-hmm. And see how, see how her face gets like, yeah. so that's the face Stern. she uses. That's not sustainable. <laughs> so even in our church, we're pretty careful in terms of how we build the leadership structures so that you would have a community group leader, or maybe you would call that a small group leader. Yeah. And those would be your go-to people for pastoral care, for a deeper life on life relating. And then those people would contact us if there's something that comes that's pastoral in nature that's above their pay grade. In other right. words, something they aren't skilled, equipped to handle that we would step in and help with. And we have to make ourselves available for those kinds of contexts. Joyce is um, wrecking up the notes right now. Okay. She's going to the next, the next part. Yeah. And we're okay. going to talk about that. But. Yeah. The idea that the pastor is the community developer or the social Social convener. convener. Yeah, the social convener. So this is like um, you're new and you've come to a church and you meet with the pastor and say, like, I'm really looking for friends. And I actually I actually think of myself a bit as a connector. I like doing that. You are good at it. But I think um, when it becomes an expectation or the pastor's fault that you haven't made friends in a church. Right. Or that you're going to organize all kinds of... Um, outreach in the city, or you're going to well, do... outreach, maybe. I can see outreach, but maybe if you're going to... Yeah, but community development in, in terms of, like, we're just going to do a lot of good things together. Yeah, or, like, campouts or, like, YMCA yeah. times. Yeah, or just all the backyard fun. 
Yeah. That the pastor would be responsible to organize all of those things. That's not right. what a pastor should be no. maybe spending the bulk of their time on. Right. The, all, the other one that we put down is the pastor is not the CEO of the church. And I think that thinking has kind of crept in. We have even terms like executive pastors and that kind of We're stuff. We're not, a, if you're an executive pastor, we love you. Right. I, I, I actually think that's a le legitimate job. It, yes, in a certain context, but that language comes from the business world. But but I'm not against the business world. I I'm not the against business. the business world, but the church is not a business. The church is not a business, but we are managing multi-million dollar budgets. Yes. But that's and where the wanna, idea and we want to steward it well. But that's where the pastor as CEO has kind of come from. So you speak to it. The pastor is not CEO pastor in is, what way? I don't think. Um, I think you wrote this one down. Come so on, you have to I'm going to put you there. No, because I think, I, I actually think at some level, um, I think the pastor has to be aware of the finances. And I think this is something that most people yes. in, the, in the congregation are unaware of. That if you're and dealing with a large budget, this takes up a large portion of your time. Or even if you're not dealing time. with a large budget. If you're in a church a that's A budget of more than five size. bucks. I'm saying right. more than five bucks. Most pastors who are transitioning, like you've done youth and young adults, and you're looking for another thing, or you're going to go be a church planter, most pastors are unprepared for how much administration and finance yes. and right. strategy that they will have to do. So right. there is that element. And I actually think because a pastor is generally not trained, in these kinds of um, areas, right. which I think is a fall down in in seminary, etc. Yes, cetera, yes. Um, it takes us more time to learn it. Right, and we need good people around us. Right, but this is where um, a church board has very important functions right. for fiscal responsibilities. I love you, Brenda. And people can be on those teams. And the pastor can be there in an advisory capacity and should be in the know, but they don't have to do all the things. Right. So when we're talking about pastor as CEO and rolling out, you know, um, whatever that system is, that whatever that approach is to church life, if the bulk of your energies are going there, that's not the role of a pastor. Well, they say statistically, when a pastor rolls out a building campaign, so whether it's small or large, it doesn't actually matter. That pastor has a much higher percentage of leaving uh, once the building project is complete. Yep. That's very, very common. And there's a reason for that. It's usually because the pastor is ill-equipped. Um, and often they don't just leave that job. They leave ministry. Right. So there's something about that that we have to pay attention to. Our expectations that, if, especially if you're in the business world and you're expecting the pastor to function like an executive in your business world, that might be, then you're gonna end up fairly disappointed because that's not what we're called to do and it's not what we're trained to do. Right, okay, so the last thing the pastor is generally not is a social media influencer. <laughs> Or on Twitter. Now, I'm, we only put this one because like, I, I wouldn't necessarily think that, but I've had a few people say to me, how come you don't, how come you you don't post active? more? How come right. you don't post more? How come you're not on the Facebook? You not should be Facebook, using that Facebook as anymore, a platform cause... to communicate yes. to all your people yes, more. Yes, that's true. I feel very stressed when people say that because have you seen my week? And right. have you seen the pictures I take? No, you don't want to see. And then remember about a year ago, I was trying to rejig the down to earth social mm. media and I Give put that on love. pause. Because she's going to do it. I am, and I've been building it, and I'm going to replace all the squares, and everyone's going to say, wow, wow. that's just so I'm, good. I'm going to weep when but I see it. But then we got to find someone, God love us, to help run it in an ongoing way, because who's got time for this? Right. Energy or skill set. Somebody, the like, pandemic, like maybe pastors under 30, they're all going to be social media influencers. Put your hand up, um, especially if you actually like have a massive amount of s sort of experience and skill and metrics behind it but okay so th so these are the things the pastor is not right what is so the... so this is a problem though for the church this creates i think theological problems mm -hmm. the, the long-term trajectory creates theological problems for us because for, for a few reasons i think it creates lack of health for the pastor but then also for the church yeah. as well um and we talked about this already but the expectations and the disappointments that come along with those expectations and then that perpetuates woundedness not just with the people leaving, but the people present, not just for the pastor, but, but the community, right? So those dis that disappointment sort of vortex you can get caught right. in. And it creates burnout for the pastor. I mean, I think uh, we've all seen over this last year and a half, 
like the suicide rates for pastors are way too high yeah. for for what it should be and part of that has to do with the anxiety and the pressure I, yeah and the pressure well and like if your people are really disappointed and frustrated and putting pressure and like the pastor feels like they're failing all the time that also creates maybe some for some in the worst situations suicidal ideation but it can also um, create job insecurity like <laughs> it's the only job I know where we have to keep everybody happy so they keep putting money in the Mm -hmm. box or whatever or through the online platform so that we can keep being employed it's a very awkward thing maybe it's not the only job but it's not the same as being able to go out and do sales or um, somebody else is responsible for that aspect of you the place you work and you just do your part in the company and and you receive your paycheck and so that job insecurity can play in in really weird ways so then pastors can become um, beholden to the wrong people for the wrong reasons, right. etc. And then I, I think it does create consumers and armchair critics. Mm -hmm. So if you have the wrong expectation of your pastor, then what you do is when you haven't gone out to eat with them in two months, then you leave church and criticize them all the way home. But it's not because your pastor is bad. It's because you have an unhealthy expectation of what he or she is able to right. do for you. And then we also have in the hopper the cultural success metric or consumerism that is like, it just isn't meeting my needs or mm -hmm. this or that. Um, that's part of why we have some of this lack of health around right. the role of the pastor and then the pastor even knowing what they're supposed to be right. spending so their the time idea, and energy like, on. Uh, I always get quite nervous if somebody comes to my church and says, well, I was going to this church, but the pastor didn't spend enough time with us. Right. And what I want to say right away is, and you probably will be disappointed here, here too. as well. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's not crass. I, and I probably actually don't, in my twenties, I would have actually said that out loud, but the reality is, um, it's it's not it's not meanness. It's just when you're living in reality, you know what your week looks like. Yeah, and I think this is where we asked our friends, you know, to weigh in, and some of them obviously couldn't. I mentioned that at the beginning, but the idea that I think across the board, pastors are really relieved this episode's being made for a reason, even though it's awkward in some ways for Jess and I to speak about it because. You know, we don't want to hurt anybody, but at the same time, we realize there's a there's a necessity for people to understand what then what is a pastor, right? Hey, we've got some big news to share with you. Season three for the Down to Earth podcast is about to drop. We're super stoked that this season is going to be available both as a video and audio podcast. So on all your regular platforms where you've been finding us all along and video podcasting will be available on YouTube. We're going to roll season three in 12 episodes dropping monthly. If you want to get in on knowing when every episode is going to drop, we'd love you to join our down to earth listening community by signing up with your email address at www dot down to earth podcast dot com where you can sign up right there for the newsletter and that'll give you all the down to earth information that you need thanks for being part of our listening community we're really looking forward to this season you know we don't want to hurt anybody but at the same time we realize there's a there's a necessity for people to understand what then what is a pastor right to do with their vocation? What <laughs> because, is the role? As we were talking about this, I said to Joyce, we really got to get to what is a pastor because I mean, we are, we can't just live in the what we're not. Like, right. I'm sorry, I don't do that. You feel like there's some <laughs> weird fast food restaurant that tells people all the things we you don't, don't do. We don't serve that. It's so not on the menu. there is a lot of things. And I think there are a lot of ways that it is absolutely viable to, to rely on and expect things from have your pastor. expectations yes, yes you must have so expectations. let's talk about okay. what those things so, are so a pastor is a shepherd yeah i mean that is actually the literal translation of the word pastor okay so we're not talking about the shepherding movement though that in is the 1980s a, yeah. there was a shepherding movement and the shepherding movement basically 
meant that your pastor took control of all areas of your life. Like they took your credit cards, I think. Yeah, maybe, or who you could date or not date, or who you could marry, or whether you should buy a house or not. The pastor okay, had to so approve all So we're not talking about that. We are not. No. In any way, we would consider that quite abusive, spiritually abusive. Right. So we're talking about the idea that we would feed, water, mm -hmm. nourish, care for, protect the flock of people that God's yeah. given to us. And of course, the Lord is my shepherd. Like the idea that God is the good shepherd, that he's the ultimate pastor, and that we are pastors pastoring like him or mm -hmm. pointing people to the, the great pastor. So, I mean, the difference between uh, a pastor and being a shepherd and God being a shepherd is obviously that God is um, omnipresent, omnipotent right things that the pastor and is omniscient not. although right. we like to think we might be all-knowing we are not no <laughs> no and you know what the other thing is somebody could say well what about the priesthood of all believers like yes there is this idea of the priesthood of all believers and peter's very clear about that in the new testament and we would agree that all of us are called by god all of us are gifted by god all of us have particular things that the spirit of god is empowering us to do in the world we're talking about vocational pastoring right so not the priesthood of all believers but the call and i think we've lost sight of the idea that god calls people to lead in the church and that that's um that's particularly this thing so shepherding yeah. and i think the second thing is that equipping is the primary job of the pastor so Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 5 tells us that that's what we're supposed to be spending our time doing. It's equipping the saints to do the ministry. Right. So, yeah, it says technically equip the saints for works of service. And we often then flip it around and we expect the pastors to do the works of service for the saints. And so if you've had that idea that the pastor does it and you watch or you benefit from or you are blessed by, but not that you would then do um, the works of the kingdom or that you would be equipped to serve, then there's something imbalanced in that. And the pastor maybe isn't living into the vocation, the way that Ephesians describes equipping the saints. So, you know, some churches, they spend a lot of time teaching and that is not a bad thing, but it doesn't actually always translate into doing. And that's where we fall down. So, if you are like, what's my pastor supposed to be doing? Your pastor is supposed to be equipping you and others in your community to do the very things that Jesus has called us to and, do. And that doesn't mean that pastors themselves don't do the work. However, they do the work as an example. Yeah. It's, it's so, as an example. And taught. Yeah, so that people can follow. So that means that, of course, pastors are going to counsel people, walk with people, pray with people, all those things. I, I always say uh, to my to our leadership team, I always say, if we're not actually leaning into that, right. it just means that we're not to do all the work. All we're to show people how to go about doing yep. it. And, and that's, a, like, I think that's easy to talk about. Like here, it's very easy. Oh yeah, mm. we're supposed to equip the saints. But, I and mean, not every pastor is hard. a teaching pastor. No. So like you and I have teaching gifts. Um, not every pastor I know is got a teaching gift. So that's not necessarily what they do. It's not how but, they equip. But the equipping will still be there. Yes, you can equip in a thousand a different ways. A thousand ways, yes. Right. So okay. that's a primary thing. The other thing I think pastors must do is be prophetic cultivators uh, within the community of God's people. So right. uh, how do you describe being a prophetic cultivator? It's like, it's this thing of distilling what's the Holy Spirit saying to the this community? How am I going to um, help people recognize that, lean into that, um, reach for more of the Lord um, in and through us? Wendell Berry, uh, you probably heard us talk about him in previous episodes, but um, he's my favorite poet and he writes a lot about farming and being with the land and in creation. And Eugene Peterson, who's often regarded as a pastor of pastors, um, in his life, just the way he helped shape the church. Uh, he said, if you read Wendell Berry and everywhere he speaks of the farmer, put in the word pastor. And when he speaks of the farm, put in the word church. Um, and when he speaks of crops, think of, you know, the, the flourishing or the life of the church. You'll understand better what it is that the church is to be about and what the role of the pastor is to be. And I think that's a good way of describing it. It's like tending, cultivating, um, nurturing, causing to grow, 
um, health and, and that also is a prophetic aspect. That's why I say prophetic cultivator. What do you right. think? Yeah, I think also, so I think we're prophetic cultivators for sure, but I think we are ministers of the presence of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like I think we are pastors are to be people that bring the very presence of Jesus with them. And this is not... Is it, isn't that true of all Christians? Yes, but I think we're to model that. It, we're to lead in that. Yes. So I think... Um, this it's, is the, the, it, it's not efficient. No, it's not efficient because bringing <laughs> sitting with somebody in a hospital is not an efficient use of time. Right. And that's where this would be in contrast to what I was talking about with CEO expectations or whatever. Right. So it's not like being a pastor is not productivity focused. I, yes. Okay. So now this is something I, 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 I'm always struggling with because I'm a person that likes to write. Like, Get it I, done. Every day, <laughs> I have whole books of lists of things, and I like to check them off. Yeah. Even if I've done something before, sometimes I write it down. So Afterwards, can, so you can just check do the checkbox. Yeah, but like I think of <laughs> Ephesians. Back to Ephesians five. Ephesians five sixteen says we are to redeem the time. Okay, so now I have used that scripture incorrectly. But it, but it doesn't say we're not to be efficient with the time. We're to okay. redeem the time. And that's a different uh, lens. Hmm. So I think sometimes the work of the pastor is slow. And like, it's not, it's not, yeah. um, I don't often get to the end of my day and go, wow, look at all the things I that did. That was so efficient I, I and productive. I definitely always call you if I have a, a product, very productive day. I'm so day. excited and proud of myself. And then she rattles off all the all things the, she did. Yes, and and then I kind of wilt on the other end thinking. No, you don't. You're sometimes proud of me too. I am excited, but I no. know how little my life actually feels like that. So what I would say is for any pastors <laughs> listening, I think this is important that we speak to pastors who have been caught in this idea that they need to be very efficient and they are, are less... Um, remembering to be about the ministry of presence. And yeah. I think Henry Nouwen probably talks about this better than anybody. Um, but that is part of our role as pastors is to be present to the people. And this is where you'd go, well, weren't we talking about that? Uh, and you said you couldn't do that a few minutes ago. Well, that's pastor as friend. I think that's a false expectation. Yeah. But if you're a pastor who's like so busy mapping the future arc of the church, writing the sermon series outline, in your office doing all your book study, getting ready for the teaching, and you're not with people, you're not being present to people, you'll have missed something of what we're called to do as pastors. So as a person who has not always been a pastor, when my brother died, um, we had pastors in our church, Mark and Andrea Gencola, who just came and were the presence of Jesus to our family. Yeah. Like I can't think of um, more and more impactful pastor in my life. Right. And that wasn't because they were preaching sermons at me no, or present um, to you in your suffering. And they and they weren't like um, you know, at that time I wasn't a pastor, so we weren't like colleagues or they just were at our house. Yeah. Sitting there. And I think that yeah. that changed um, my life in profound, profound ways. So I think we can and I, I don't think they ever went home and would have said, Wow, what a productive day we had sitting there. Right. Well, and the, like in the big situations, obviously this was a very serious situation when your brother David died, but also in like some of the mundane. Yeah. Like we think yeah. of this, uh, you know, a borrow from Henry now, and he he says um, it's a privilege to practice that simple ministry of presence. But the the idea that it's simple is um, false. It's not as simple as it seems. Um, he says this, my own desire to be useful, to do something significant, to be a part of some impressive project is so strong that soon my time is taken up in meetings and conferences and study groups and workshops that prevent me from walking the streets. It is difficult not to have plans, not to organize around some urgent cause. He kind of goes on and on. But he says, I wonder more and more. If the first thing shouldn't be to know people by name, to eat and drink with them, to listen to their stories and tell your own, and to let them know with words, handshakes, and hugs that you do not simply like them, you love them. Right. And there is some aspect to that that we must do as pastors, and there is a desire in people to be known. Yeah. Um, that we have to attend to that doesn't tip into, now you get me to be your BFF, but it doesn't also mean we don't go and be with the people. Right. 
Because that is a, that's the there, tension. There, there is serious tension there, though. And I, so I think if you have had expectations that your pastor would be your friend and you're feeling like bad about that, I, I think don't feel bad about that. What you're looking for, though, I think it's just a reorganization of expectations. Yeah. I think to have an expectation to be known and to be loved and to be loved is not a poor expectation. And that we would hear the stories. Mm-hmm. Like, that's really, really important. You think about how Jesus. If you want to model after Jesus as a leader, and certainly he was rabbi, teacher, but I think very pastorally present to those he was leading and discipling and wider communities, um, maybe like you think in certain contexts in the New Testament. But he was eating at tables with people. He was listening to them. We don't see Zacchaeus then becoming his closest companion. Right. But he was really um, impacted, and that was because Jesus knew him and knew his story. Right. And... so I think yeah. in a lot of ways, we are quotidian leaders. Um, Every Kathleen day. No- Kathleen Norris talks about this in Quotidian Mysteries. Yeah, but she's talking more she's like... She's talking more like, I know, but I, I think... The mundane. In, but I think as leaders and as mm. pastors, what we have to teach people is to live um, in the excitement of their Christianity in the boring parts of life. Yeah. Because I think a lot of us want to have a life that is like... A Intergalactic. Movie. Well, a movie. Yeah. All the boring parts. Like, you don't ever watch a movie and see someone brushing their teeth in the movie. <laughs> very, very Or, like, grocery shopping. And I think our job as pastors is to teach people how to live for Jesus in these moments of mm. boring... Um, yeah, the rooted life Yeah. in the mundane that flies in the face of some of the the values of the culture that would chase after big and shiny. And maybe that's partly what Nalan's talking about in being so caught up with meetings and conferences and planning these, the next big whatever. Maybe we need both for pastors and for people to be able to figure out how we journey alongside people in the mundane so that we become better right. signposts. Of I can't remember who said it. Maybe Christ. it was Annie Dillard who said, our job as Christians is to push against the culture as hard as it pushes against patterns that pushes into us. Yep. And I think as pastors, we must be people who lead the way yep. in and, that. Yeah. And, and they, that flies in the face of what a celebra- the celebritization of pastors has become. Right. So I think part of our, our biggest role in this season is to show people how to live in a rooted and grounded way um, in, in a way that honors Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about John Wright, um, uh, the story of narrative preaching, maybe. I can't remember which book it was, but he talks about the church as a contrast society Mm. and that we would, yeah, teach, model, and get engaged in the life Mm. that is the contrast. Right. Right? That's that's that kind of arcing leadership. Okay. So, So where does this leave us? Well, I think we have to have healthy expectations of pastors and healthy practices in relating to each other. So pastors relating to people in their communities and vice versa. Um, So maybe some really basic practical top tips, like at the very beginning of like, well, what can I expect of my pastor beyond showing up to church on Sunday and somebody saying hello to me or hearing someone preach or lead in worship? Like, what is my, what am I supposed to be able to expect? I I think you should be able to expect some kind of relationship. Like I, we would never say get a doctor and never have a relationship with them. We actually know, like there are studies that show if you have a relationship with your doctor, you're going to get better health outcomes. I would say you have a relationship with your pastor, you're going to get better spiritual Spiritual. outcomes. So I think, but I mean, no one would ever assume that your doctor should be calling to check in on you. Right. To say like, hey, just wondering how you're feeling right right now. That's never going to happen. So you must think through the lens of make an appointment. Make an appointment. That's a beginning basic thing. If you have need... And your community group leader, uh, you, you've, you've been down that route, you've got some others, some maybe mentoring relationships in the life of the church, some friendships, but you know this is, this is something else I need to go talk to the pastor about, make an appointment. And don't ask the pastor to fit that in to their downtime. Think of it as a professional relationship. You would go, you would get some time off to go see your physiotherapist, 
to um, Your chiropractor. Yeah, people all the time. We got a dental appointment, this and that. You can get permission for a professional appointment to be absent from work most of the time. Most people or can. just find out when your pastor prefers to meet you. Right. He or she may not mind meeting you at night. Right. And we quite often um, will have appointments that we'll book, say, on Sundays because we have to work, you know, a good five hours anyway. So then we'll fit in maybe three hours of appointments afterward. Yeah. And I mean, I think some of the things, there's lots of things that it's very appropriate to talk to your pastor about. I mean, you've got a big spiritual need. You're making a big decision in life. You, yeah. Just you, you might not need a therapist to talk about it. You just have a spiritual question. Or you question. might even just want to also serve in a very particular way. Right. Or you, you feel like idea. the Spirit of God's laid something on your heart for the community of faith. Right. Like those are appropriate reasons to say, hey, can I meet with you? Discernment issues. I'm trying yeah. to figure something out. With the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. Who to get me. married. Maybe you've right. been diagnosed with some really serious illness. Um, yeah, you're going to see your doctor for that. And but you might have a big theological um, dilemma that you've bumped into with regard to your understanding of suffering or how you're supposed to pray in a season like this, or you feel um, you, you can't even feel like you can connect with God. These are very appropriate reasons right. to want or to meet with your you're pastor. you're planning a wedding, right. you're planning a funeral, you, need, you want to get your baby, baby dedicated, dedicated, all these right. kinds of things. Baptized. I would like to get baptized, please. Yeah. Talk to us. These are the very reasons we signed up. So... We don't want people to hear that your pastor does not want you to call them. Right. That, that's don't not, bug your pastor. No, no that's, that's, that's not, not the message. All. We, we actually think there does need to be um, relationship and a knowing and a loving, of and course. It's also appropriate for your pastor to call you. So all the pastors listening, we also don't just take a back seat and not reach relationally toward others. Maybe the Lord's laid somebody on your heart all week and you, yeah, maybe have tossed up a couple of prayers, but it's, it's also very okay for them to, to contact you, to shoot you a text or to pick up the phone or to say, hey, you've been on my heart. Is there anything particular I can be praying for you for this mm-hmm. week? Like, um, and you don't necessarily have to disclose, but it's sometimes those things provoked by the Holy Spirit are uh, us doing what we're supposed to be doing leaning in and listening, not not just passively waiting for people to reach out um, to us. I guess the one other thing I wanted to bring up was mentoring. Uh, I probably get asked one or two times a week, will you mentor me? Um, It can be my, you know, neighbor. It's somebody who's listened to the podcast. It's somebody in my local church. It's somebody from before who I pastored who just doesn't have that same kind of Um, person that's influencing their life and I'm like and here's my whole body of work with the podcast let that be you know sort of the, Mm -hmm. the bulk of what I can deposit in your life I do mentor people but I'm going to be invested in leaders in the life of my church so that they can lead the the many I'll lead the few right it's just a metric of yeah, I also, I also think it's a fairly loaded question mm-hmm. when somebody asks me that question I often uh, ask this back and what is what is your What's expectation in that is it that we would meet three times a week is it that um, so I, I think really what what it requires any relationship requires um, a, a really honest and open conversation. Right. Right. So I've had situations where another pastor who's younger, maybe starting out in ministry or taking on a new role, may ask me to mentor them. And I will set up three meetings in a year to kind of listen and we'll bookend it. Like, and this is, you know, I'm going to listen where the struggles are and give some input and and then we'll, we'll do that. And that's the end of it. it does, it's not in perpetuity for the rest of your mm-hmm. life. And I also think, I went to a seminar years ago and it was really good and kind of debunking the idea of mentoring. Mm -hmm. And they had us write down on a piece of paper any books that we'd read that had ever influenced us, any historical figures, any movies we'd watch that, you know, documentaries, whatever. And I had this huge list. And then this person teaching said, you've been mentored by all these people. And I realized I'd been mentored, you know, Mm -hmm. by... um, Wendell Berry or Mm -hmm. Eugene Peterson or C.S. Lewis or Kathleen Norris or any of the people that had shaped and influenced um, my journey in following Jesus or in any particular areas that I've learned to grow. Right. I mean, I think we do have a lot of um, unrealistic expectations around face-to-face. Yeah. um, The relational Mm -hmm. pressure that one person could be 
all of these things, like a Paul Timothy kind of journey. And right. I think, well, I don't know if that's so, very I mean, doable. I think, I think if we're really honest, uh, I think this is something that all pastors deal with and all mm -hmm. congregants are dealing with. But I yep. think on a larger level, I think the reason we thought we had to address this is somewhat for female pastors particularly, mm -hmm. this issue, I, and I think we didn't talk about bringing this up, but I think we have to. Because I mm -hmm. think if you're a female pastor listening to this, you'll probably identify with some of the pressures a little bit more than more. our male colleagues. Well, my husband does not get the expectation for relationality that I do. No, and that partly it's because our culture tells us that females are relational. And men are busy. Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> and so, so um, if you're a female pastor, right. I, I think if we're gonna see any movement in this area, like more women, I, I said to Joyce a few weeks ago, part of me is a little bit disappointed that in terms of female leadership, mm -hmm. I feel like the church is somewhat in the same position as it was 25 years ago when we began yeah, ministry. Yeah, it might even have gone backwards a little bit. A little bit. So if you're a female pastor, we, we really want to speak to you and say, don't put false expectations on yourself. And it's okay to have boundaries. Yeah. It's okay to say, no, Friday night is a sacred night for our family, and I don't work on those nights. Yeah. It's okay to say, I can't meet you at 10 at night. Right, or I'm not going to be a nurturing mother in your life just because I'm female. I'm actually a pastor, and I have a very different vocational goal um, in terms of what I'm called to do by God, and it isn't And I think that. this is a particular thing that you and I probably speak to because neither of us would be... I mean, I just always say to people, you might need a therapist, but you do not want me as your therapist. <laughs> we would be too no. straight. No, it, ah. like it's not going to be. Yeah. So it, this has actually been an issue. And I, I've seen many of my female um, pastoring colleagues burn out because they have felt the pressure of being everybody in the church's friend or having to mentor everybody who asks them. And so part or, of the yeah. reason we wanted to do this is for younger leaders who would come behind us um, and learn some of the things that nobody ever told us. Yeah. Nobody ever told me I could say no. Yeah, and then I would just add, whatever filter you're looking at your pastor through, if you can just remember that there are many, many needs in the life of your church, that will help you um, adjust your expectations and filter your judgment, disappointment, resentment, whatever. Let the Lord help you with that. Like, uh, yeah, yesterday we went from one meeting to the next to the next, and we got, I think, to the third, and they were, we texted, hey, we're going to be 15 minutes late. And then they were like, how's your day been going? We're like, oh, well, we had this really big meeting, and I had to talk hard things here, and oh, then we had to call um, Child protect." protective services and talk here and then we've got this vaccine outreach thing we're doing with doctors and like there's all this stuff going on all the time and there are felt needs now we got to go to the hospital somebody's marriage is in trouble like whatever it's just if you're lonely or you're wanting more connectedness in the life of the church or you're wanting to serve just put it through a filter of like, what's my first port of call? Is it the pastor or is it somebody else on the team? One of the frustrations our staff have is if we ask somebody to do something in the life of the church, they'll say yes. But if the staff asks them, they won't get back to them. They'll like ghost them on the mm -hmm. email, text, or whatever. Like, hey, can you help with communion? Or hey, can you? And nothing. And then we're like, okay, we'll reach out. And then we get a, we get a response. And I think that's terrible. So... The symbiotic kind of way of relating, don't put too much on the pastor and also um, don't sort of abdicate and just think you have no access Right, point. so basically this whole podcast is brought to you by the fact that this is difficult and yes. that's why we're talking about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. But we do, we do actually hope that this spurs some conversation for you. Yes. Maybe if you're a lay leader in your church or an elder or a board member, yep. this is something that you can talk about. And I would encourage you maybe to ask your pastors, how are they feeling in terms of their own expectation? Right. Uh, because I think this allow, I think if we can just have it as a conversation Honesty. piece, yeah. um, then it will allow really solid boundaries. I know our board really began to ask Dave and I a number of years ago, 
how we were feeling about this. And they just put some really good boundaries yeah. in place. Like, yeah, it can lead to great flourishing. Right. And I think that, and, I, and I think like for, for us, I, I particularly for me, I needed the boundaries. I needed someone to tell me you cannot go out with more than six. Well, they really said five and I moved it to nine. <laughs> but I never will have a week where I said I went out with ten. I shouldn't say never, but very rare. Very rarely will I say I went out with ten people that week because I had somebody else putting the boundaries in place for yeah. me. So you Best might be, practice wisdom. Yes. yes. And I think the one note I would love to leave us on is: Can you remember to pray for your pastors? Mm -hmm. If you can pray for your pastors, it's always going to help your own heart, and mm -hmm. it will really help your pastors. Like. I think we minimize, we think pastor's job is to pray for the life of the church and pastors ought to pray more than they do. Statistically, we didn't even touch that part. Um, but yeah, we really want you to pray for pastors, your pastors, pastors you know, um, pastors who've served you over your lifetime because right now there is such pressure and such fatigue in the church because of many things pastors have been through in the last year and a half, I would say that um, we'd love to see that the predictions about how many are going to quit end up not coming true because the Lord really has helped us support, care for, and cause to flourish yeah. in the church. Amen. All right. See you next time.